Uh, how's it going, everybody? So uh, I'm going to talk to you today about Space Monster and Espionage, but first I'll introduce myself. Uh, so like a lot of you, I grew up watching hackers and uh, thought it'd be really cool to become one of those guys. Uh, I even got a pair of rollerblades to show you my dedication to hacking. Um, a little after that, I thought I should become cool instead, and so I got into punk rock and anarchism and activism through that, and uh, you know, got my picture in the newspaper and all that. Uh, and then uh, I decided I should probably combine my hacking and my activism uh, to do a better job of activism and a better job of helping the world. Uh, several years after that, I conned the folks at EFF into giving me a job, and I've been there for the last four years, working on Privacy Badger for the first couple of years, and now... Uh, thanks. <laughs> and now I'm on our cybersecurity team. Uh, so what do I mean when I say cybersecurity? Uh, people talk a lot about the cybers, and they're usually talking about something like this, one of these thready pew pew maps of uh, packets apparently uh, being dropped on other countries like so many cluster bombs. Um, and I'm not really interested in cyber warfare. Countries are gonna fight each other. That's the, that's the natural state of nation states. And if they wanna do that, that doesn't really affect me in any meaningful way. A lot of people also like to talk about cyber espionage, spies spying on other spies. And again, that's what spies do. Spies spy on other spies. And if spies want to spy on each other and countries want to spy on each other, there's some really neat technology, but it doesn't affect really day to day the people that I care about. Uh, and then the other thing that people like to talk about is cyber crime. And again, this involves stealing money, and there's a lot of cops working on that, and I don't really care to help cops do their job. They're just fine on their own. So, what I care about is cybersecurity for these people. I care about cybersecurity for dissidents, gay rights activists, feminists, journalists, people in countries where you might get arrested, where you don't have free speech. That's what I'm interested in. I want to protect people who are the most vulnerable and I want to use them and who are being targeted by extremely powerful interests. And I want to use my skills to do that. And I want to encourage you to use your skills to do that as well. So EFF cybersecurity team, uh, what do we do? Well, EFF has done some pretty good work on fighting mass surveillance, mostly through increasing encryption on the transport layer through projects like HTTPS Everywhere and CertBot and Let's Encrypt. And through that, we've made mass surveillance a lot more expensive. And now I want to do the same thing that our community, our whole community, not just EFF by any means, I want to do the same thing that we've done for mass surveillance for targeted digital surveillance, because I think that this is the next place that nation states are going to go. So we do research state-sponsored malware, stalkerware, police surveillance technology like MC catchers. We do policy work, working with lawmakers, trying to get better laws around how these are used, warrant requirements, things like that. And we do legal work as well. So the cost of mass surveillance is rising uh, every day, thanks to ubiquitous encryption, thanks to more people using encryption, and thanks to more awareness generated by people like Edward Snowden. A lot more people are aware of this now and taking steps against it. And it's getting harder and harder for countries to do this, especially for smaller countries when somebody leaves their borders and they can't have their national telephone company spy on that person anymore. But meanwhile, the cost of targeted digital surveillance is dropping rapidly. Previously, you had countries like the USA and countries like Israel. The USA had TAO, Tailored Access Operations Division of the NSA, which was our own our very own hacking squad, basically, that was doing really highly complex, highly targeted digital attacks on people. And now, every country can afford their own TAO on a shoestring budget. So we first learned about this trend with uh, a series of reports on a company called FinFisher. The, uh, this report by Citizen Lab, which is an amazing group out of Tor uh, Toronto. Toronto? Uh, if you uh, aren't familiar with them, you should check them out. So they did an amazing analysis of a campaign called FinSpy, uh, which was Finn Fisher's spyware software. And they were able to, find, to discover through mapping the internet several countries that had bought the Finn Fisher and FinSpy software, including the ones above. And you can see Kazakhstan, Lebanon, Ethiopia, other countries that wouldn't have, certainly wouldn't have been able to afford a TAO like uh, operation can now suddenly afford to have their own targeted hacking apparatus. 
We found out more about FinSpy uh, and Hacking Team, which was another similar company, through th this puppet here. Uh, so this puppet is the uh, in, in real-world persona of a hacker or perhaps group of hackers named Phineas Fisher. So Phineas Fisher hacked Finn Fisher and Hacking Team and leaked a huge cache of emails, software, documents, and price sheets. And what we found out is that Finn Fisher costs about a million dollars to set up. Now, that's a lot of money for you and me, but that's not a lot of money for even a very small poor nation state. But it was still too much for some nation states. And one of the other things we found out in the emails was that it was still too much for nation states to keep up every year, and the support was too hard for nation states. They couldn't, Finn Fisher would sell them the software and the hardware they needed, but then they couldn't figure out how to set it up and use it and actually fish people and spy on people. So today I'm gonna to talk to you about a new nation state spying campaign that me and my colleagues discovered called Dark Caracal. And before I get into it, I wanna say that I'm up here alone on this stage, but I didn't work on this alone by any means. Uh, my colleagues, Mike Flossman and Andrew Blake from Lookout, and my colleague and boss, Eva Galperin from EFF, in addition to a bunch more people from EFF and Lookout uh, and other places that didn't want to be named for reasons that will become obvious later, uh, we're the only idiots that wanted to put our names on this thing. Um, but. The best, all the best hacking and all the best security research is done by teams because fuck rock stars. Rock stars are bullshit. And I'm gonna get on my soapbox now. I'm just saying every hacker rock star in the last year has turned out to be a rapist. So let's maybe not do that. Let's maybe not fucking do that. Anyway. Um, so thanks to everybody who helped with this. So the background of this, sorry, off the soapbox now. The background of this is, uh, has anyone in here heard of Operation Mantle? This is a report that me and Eva put out previously. No one, okay, great. So Operation Mantle was a report that me and Eva put out in 2016. And it was a report about some nation state spyware that we had found. It came to us by way of this woman, Irina Petrushova. Ms. Petrushova is the editor-in-chief for Kazakhstan's only independent newspaper called Respublika. Irina Petrushova had been attracting the ire of the Kazakh government for many, many years by posting inflammatory things about Kazakhstan's government. To be clear, Kazakhstan has, Kazakhstan's current and only ever president is not a huge fan of freedom of speech or freedom of press, as you might have guessed. Um, so she was the target of a lot of threats, including uh, somebody left a human skull on her door, and then a few months after that, they killed her dog, left the dog's body on her door, and the head of the dog on her home door with a note pinned to it that said there will be no next time. And then a couple of months later, they firebombed her office and burned it down. Shortly after that, she left the country, uh, which was probably a smart move. Around the time she left the country, this site popped up called CasaWord. CasaWord was a site that had a huge dump of leaked emails from the government of Kazakhstan, detailing all sorts of interesting things, one of which was a plan to have a digital spying campaign against Kazakhstan's only opposition politician. Needless to say, the government of Kazakhstan was very upset about this, and they assumed that this was the doing of Irina Petrushova. So now, being that she was out of the country and they could no longer firebomb her office, they decided to sue her in US court. And luckily, she got in touch with EFF. So we started representing her, and we started giving her phishing trainings. And around that same time, wouldn't you know it, she started receiving spear phishing emails. So these are a couple examples of the emails that she got. Uh, this is a spear phishing email that was sent to uh, her brother, Alexander Petrushov, which claims to be from a lawyer, a human rights lawyer named Eric Rushat, who's a real lawyer. Uh, and interestingly, this email claims to be a legal invoice for Bolat Atabayev, who is a Kazakh dissident and theater director, who was also targeted separately also in this campaign. Uh, and the email has a PDF attachment, which when you open it, 
downloads and or it runs some JavaScript saying you need to update Adobe. And when you click that, it downloads and runs some spyware, a Trojan on your computer. So we looked into the Trojan and we found the command and control servers and we took apart the malware and we wrote a whole report about it. And it's still online if you want to read it. And at the time, we concluded that this was probably the work of the government of Kazakhstan, given that all of, their, um, all of the targets had been people who had upset the government of Kazakhstan in one way or another. And we figured that the government of Kazakhstan probably didn't do this on their own. They probably had help. And some of the indicators, some of the tactics and some of the domains looked like they were from this company called Appen, which is a now defunct Indian um, hacker for hire company, basically like the low rent version of Hacking Team or FinFisher. So we thought it was Appen, we wrote up a report, we said this is Appen, probably on behalf of the government of Kazakhstan, case closed. Well, a few months later, we found out it definitely wasn't Appen. Oops. Um, but, you know, they're still pretty scummy guys, just not this particular time. Uh, but who it was, it turns out, is even weirder. And I'm going to get into that. So a few months later, how this all started, we uh, got contacted by some, by some people at Lookout, the mobile malware company, mobile malware detection company. And um, they said, hey, we have this... We have this sample of malware that we think is related to the report you wrote. You mentioned that you thought there was a mobile component, and uh, it also talks to the same command and control servers that you guys found for Operation Mantle. And so we were like, oh, hell yeah, let's start looking at that. So we started looking into it, uh, and we named it Palace, after the, uh, which is another name for the Mantle cat, which is native to the steppes of Kazakhstan, which is why we called it Operation Mantle. I like cats. I like naming things after cats. <laughs> yeah, right? The, the internet is made of cats. Uh, so, uh, Palace is distributed in Trojanized versions of secure messaging apps. So, Signal, WhatsApp, uh, Orbot, Siphon, uh, other circumvention software. It's all backdoored versions of these apps. And the really creepy part is that the apps are fully functional. You can still connect to Tor with Orbot, with this Trojanized version of Orbot. You can still send Signal and WhatsApp messages. But it's also spying on you. So Palace can do a number of things. It can take photos. It can get your GPS coordinates. It can get your text messages and call logs. It records all nearby Wi-Fi access points, including the name, MAC address, uh, signal strength. Uh, and it can get plain text copies of encrypted messages if it's a backdoored version of WhatsApp or if it's a backdoored version of Signal. It'll retrieve those keys and decrypt them for you, or for the attacker. Palace doesn't use any exploits. Uh, and it seems like the actor favors social engineering. And much like many programmers, it seems like the actor copied and pasted from Stack Overflow. We found a number of snippets of code in the, in the decompiled Java that, were from, uh, that showed up on GitHub, that showed up on Stack Overflow. So we think somebody took little bits of this from everywhere, like all of us do. Um, and it's not... It's not super sophisticated. It's a pretty, this is a pretty low barrier to DIY surveillance apparatus, but it doesn't need to be sophisticated to be effective, and this was extremely effective. We also found a ton of desktop uh, RATS, which stands for Remote Access Trojan, or Trojan. We found a ton of desktop malware as well. And unlike the mobile malware, the desktop malware used chain zero-day exploits pivoting access off of compromised SCADA systems using the blockchain for exfiltration. No, that's bullshit. <laughs> but if, if any VCs want to throw money at me now, feel free. I won't do anything for you, to be clear, but you can give me money. Uh, no, so it was phishing. Uh, the desktop used phishing as well, and again, there weren't any exploits. It was just phishing and people clicking and running JavaScript and downloading and executing stuff they shouldn't. Um, so what did we find? Uh, on the desktop side, we found 
infected documents, which were presumably sent over email, Word, Excel, and PDF files with macros. This is an attack that's been around since the 90s, and it still works. It's still super effective. Um, and I mean, it works well. People were definitely infected with this. So we found, okay, so we found two variants of malware. The first one we found is called Banduk, and uh, Banduk was originally observed as part of Operation Mantle, but we found a new variant being used as part of Dark Caracal in this case. Banduk is the Hindi word for gun. It's also the Lebanese word for smart guy or bastard, I'm told. Um, it's modular. The operator can add new features or download new features even after the system is infected. It's Windows only, uh, but it's available for sale online. Uh, for less than $100. The versions that we found seem to be a private copy. They're a little more advanced than the ones you can get readily online. Um, and we found it in Trojanized copies of a drawing program and in Trojanized copies of Siphon as well, which mimics the MO of the mobile malware. Uh, and Banduke is uh, obfuscated in a pretty interesting way. So with Banduke, all of the malware-related Windows API strings are encrypted and Base64 encoded. And then when the malware is run, Banduke decrypts those in memory. Then it uses those decrypted API strings to run the system calls to decrypt a second stage that's stored as a binary blob, the way that like maybe an image would be stored in an exe file. It decrypts that, which is the actual payload binary, and runs it entirely in memory. So we had to get a memory snapshot and actually carve out this binary to start analyzing it. Uh, and it d does that using a technique called process hollowing, which is pretty cool. It works the same way a phage uh, takes over a bacteria, a virus, a bacteria virus takes over bacteria. It finds a running process, in this case, iExplore.exe, and it hollows out all of the machine code from the running process space. And then it inserts its own machine code in that space, and then inserts a jump call to jump and start executing its own process. So this way, Banduke is running on your system, but you never see any new process start. The iExplore process just changes. So it's really neat technique. Uh, and it took a while to, for me to figure that out with my poor reverse engineering skills. Uh, but when I did figure it out, I was, my mind was blown. Once it does that, though, it's actually not super sophisticated at that point. Uh, it uses plain text TCP to connect to the command and control server, uh, and it's base64 encoded with a suffix of three ampersands. It uses, uh, I didn't show this in the palace malware, but this is the same communication format that the palace malware uses as well, and it decodes to something like a message ID and then a computer ID and an IP address, username, the Windows version, and some other data there. So it's a pretty straightforward communication protocol. Um, and Banduk is able to start a shell. It's all able to do a ton of stuff. Uh, things like start a shell, monitor your webcam and mics, mess with system files, log you out of Skype, and download second stage infections, AMI, and TV, which we didn't find any samples of. Again, this is for sale online. And you can go download this and reverse it yourself. And it's a lot of fun. Uh, the other malware family we found is a totally new malware family, a uh, totally new malware family called CrossRat. And we've only observed CrossRat in Dark Caracal so far. The version we found was marked as version 0 0.1, and it was released in March of 2017. They helpfully documented all this for us. <laughs> and please document your malware, it's so helpful. <laughs> um, so CrossRat has very limited features. Uh, it's written in Java. Uh, so, you know, write once, run anywhere. It can uh, target a bunch of different platforms. I'm glad somebody liked that joke. Uh, it can target Windows, OS X, and Linux. So this makes it a little more useful than Banduke, depending on who your targets are. Uh, it didn't have any obfuscation or packing. And like Banduke, it used SCADA in the blockchain. Um, uh, so it communicates, again, uh, to the command and control over plain text TCP. And it uses a protocol that's pretty similar to Banduke and Palace. Message ID, uh, unique ID, IP address, Windows version, et cetera. So this, to me, indicates that it's either the same author for all three of these packages, or the author was inspired by one of the other two packages and wrote the and wrote some number of, you know, and somehow these are related is what I'm trying to get at. 
Um, and uh, Crossrat can send much of the same data as Banduke, although a lot less options than Banduke has. But webcams, system files, keylogger, et cetera, all the things that you would expect in any basic remote access Trojan. So what kind of data was Dark Caracol after? And to be clear, Dark Caracol is what we decided to name the actor. So what kind of data was Dark Caracol after? So we started looking into the command and control servers, which were the same as before. And we discovered that the actors had left Apache mod status enabled. This allowed us to see every request that was being made to the command and control servers. And more importantly, it let us see all of the victim IPs because we could see who was connecting to the command and control endpoints, but it also let us see all of the operator IPs because we could see who was connecting to the admin interfaces for the command and control endpoints. We also, through this, found the admin interfaces. And we found that there were several campaigns going on, usually named something like old B, WP9, WP7. And when we looked in those directories, we discovered that the attackers hadn't put up index files. So all of the files that had been uploaded from the phones were there for the taking to be gotten with curl. Um, so we, in, we started indexing more directories with Durbuster, and we uh, set up a script to collect the data from mod status for a course of three months. And we found, this is what we found. So there were victims, the, each of these pins uh, represents some number of victims. And we found, it was concentrated in the Middle East, but we found infections on, across over 20 countries, including China, Vietnam, South Korea, Lebanon, France, Germany, Italy, Canada, Venezuela, and the United States. And in total, we found uh, 81 gigabytes of exfiltrated data, 60% of which was from mobile devices, 40% of which was from Windows campaigns. And which shows that this, this campaign was incredibly effective despite not using any exploits. And it's kind of, it was amazing to all of us. We had no idea that such a low tech campaign could be so effective. And we're seeing more, expand, more actors expanding on desktop capability to include mobile capability. We didn't see any of this mobile capability when we were looking at Operation Mantle. But all of a sudden now we're seeing this whole mobile Trojan and this ton of data uh, coming, coming over uh, with, with this new campaign. Uh, on the desktop side, we found names, numbers, addresses, bank passwords, PIN numbers, shipping details for a business, legal documents, including some documents from Fosek Mon Mosek Fonseca, uh, desktop screenshots of the victim's browsing, an iPhone backup, and much more. Although we didn't want to take a lot of time to go through people's personal data because it feels really creepy. Um, on the mobile side, uh, this is what we found, about 480,000 text messages, 264,000 files, uh, 200,000 Wi-Fi SSIDs, uh, 250,000 contacts, et cetera, et cetera. Um, about, found about 450 victims just on one command and control server. And after we got out of the servers, we were told by other researchers that we had only found the tip of the iceberg as far as what was available on these servers. So, uh, did we hack these guys? No, we didn't hack these guys at all. The operators were stupid and they left their indexes open. We didn't have to break a single law, we just used curl. We were as, about as elite as this kid. <laughs> but luckily for us, these guys were even less elite. <laughs> so, what about the infrastructure and the command and control? Uh, we were able to link a lot of the infrastructure based on who is registrar information and how it changed over time. Uh, and we also had a number of other interesting factors that helped us discover more of the infrastructure that was related to Dark Caracal. So first of all, they don't use Linux on their command and control servers, they use Windows. And specifically, they use XAMPP, which is the Windows version of Adobe, MySQL, and PHP, and Python, I guess, is the other P. Um, so, being that this is a fairly rare setup for a command and control server, we were able to 
pardon me, we were able to use this to find other servers on the same networks. And then we were able to collab we were able to collaborate those servers in that they also had mod status turned on and that they also had victims uploading to the same endpoints. So all in all, we found a few servers running. We think this is what it looked like when the guy set up, right? <laughs> Hi, do you want to set up a command and control? Uh, this is probably what happened. And they said, yes, we would love to set up a command and control. And Clippy didn't tell them that all of their logs and all of their exfiltrated data was going to be open to the public. Uh, looking at the who is information listed for Adobe Air, we discovered uh, about 10 other domains here, most of which were hosted on Shinjuru, which is a pretty well-known uh, bulletproof hosting provider, basically a hosting provider for criminals and spies. Uh, most notable in that they were just in the Mueller indictment for hosting uh, much of the Russian um, infrastructure. So we used this to fingerprint Dark Caracal's infrastructure. We looked for anything on Shinjiru that was running XAMPP, and then we looked at that for anything that further matched the fingerprint of our guys. Uh, and we were able to identify a bunch of infrastructure with Adobe Air.net here being the main server, the first server that we found and the main server that had the most data. As we were profiling this, we found some pretty interesting stuff. We found this page, secureandroid.info, that hosts, <laughs> very secure. <laughs> that hosts a lot of apps like WhatsApp Plus, Telegram Plus, Signal Plus, Orbot Plus. Quality is better than the original. <laughs> These are enhanced versions, it says. Uh, this is where the malware came from. We downloaded some samples from here, and they matched the samples that we had found uh, previous to this. We also identified some phishing domains like this one, tweetsfb.com. Uh, while analyzing secureandroid.info. Uh, we think that they were using this to harvest Facebook credentials and then get on Facebook groups, real Facebook groups, like a number of groups they had created called Nannies and then a number after them, Nannies 2 is this one, where, and I have no idea what that means or what it stands for or anything. It makes no sense to me either. But they had real people on these groups and they were, putting out links to TweetsFB and links to secureandroid.info. We also saw text messages on the victim's phones that would say something like, hey, I want to talk to you, but we need to talk securely. Can you download this app from secureandroid.info so we can speak more securely? So we think they were primarily using phishing, phishing through text, phishing through Facebook, but targeted phishing to get at the people they were going after. Uh, and these are, these are some more examples of the phishing domains, uh, facebookservices.org, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we found a lot of these on VirusTotal as well. These guys had been pretty prolific and not very good at covering their tracks for a number of years. Uh, and we also, so we found a number of Windows, a number of C2 servers that had uploaded Windows data, all of these, some of which were in the uh, Operation Mantle report. And we found control panels for other rats as well, Iris rat, Arcom rat, which we weren't able to find any samples of. But it indicates to us that these guys, this is not their only campaign. These guys are going after a number of different targets using a number of different techniques. So what's this all gonna cost? Well, I did a little back of the napkin math. And I figured, I looked at the prices of servers on Shinjiru, and it, a good server on Shinjiru costs about 50 bucks a month. So that's about 600 bucks a year. Figure they ran them for 10 years. That's $6,000. A Lebanese software developer makes about $22,000. Uh, so two devs, and, two devs for a year and servers for 10 years comes out to about $50,000, which is 20 times less than FinFisher costs. This is an extremely cheap operation, but it was also extremely effective. Like I said, there were 80 gigabytes of data that we recovered and tons more that we didn't find that other researchers found. So it doesn't need to be expensive, and this gets to my point that targeted surveillance is getting cheaper all the time. So who are these guys anyway? Where in the world is Dark Caracal? And why have we named them this strange cat name? Well, to do our attribution, we started looking at the admin console logs, thanks to Apache. And uh, we were able to narrow it down to somewhere on Earth. 
Uh, I know, we're good. <laughs> Uh, furthermore, we were able to narrow the IP addresses down to Beirut. Now, the, uh, the actors could have been using a VPN. We don't know. Um, there's a number, you know, the IP address obviously doesn't reveal your location. We all know this. So we decided, decided to take a look at something else. And I mentioned earlier that Palace can collect the Wi-Fi SSIDs that your phone is near. So we decided to put those all into Multigo and graph them out. And we found this one big cluster here of lots of phones connecting to lots of SSIDs. But this other small little cluster popped out. And what's that? That's interesting. So let's enhance. <laughs> enhance. Uh, what we found was a number of phones connecting to one single SSID and only ever that SSID. Furthermore, these phones were the first ones to ever connect to the botnet. And all they had on them was messages like, test, test, does it work? And a picture of somebody's nostrils. I asked the FBI for access to their nostril recognition database, but they told me no. <laughs> so the, the Wi-Fi in this case is called BLD3F6, which we think stands for Building 3, Floor 6. And we also got the MAC address. So we looked it up in an open source wireless database called Weigel. And we were able to locate it roughly here, still in Beirut, and right here in the corner near the French embassy, near some other uh, colleges, in what's generally thought of as like the government quarter of Beirut, is what I'm told. Um, and so this is where it was on Weigel. But that's still, we didn't think we could quite trust that. So we had to put cyber boots on the ground. And, no, all right. <laughs> no, no, it's fine, it's fine. And what we, so what we found though, when we actually went there, shit, I just spoiled it. <laughs> what we found when we actually went there was that this access point was coming from this big orange building here, which interestingly is the only building with six floors. <laughs> and luckily for us, this building has giant Arabic letters on the side, which tell us that this building belongs to the General Directorate of General Security of Lebanon, which is like Lebanon's FBI, CIA, and NSA all rolled into one. I'm not saying that they did it. <laughs> it's totally possible that some teenagers snuck into the main spy headquarters of their country and ran a spyware operation out of there completely without their knowledge. Totally possible. For 10 years. Who knows? Um, yeah, yeah. So that was pretty cool. It's not every day that you get to narrow it down to the building they're in. But what does this mean exactly? So it's really, this is really confusing. What, what is Kazakhstan involved? It's definitely not Appen. We know that at this point. I'm pretty sure that Appen is not a wing of the Lebanese spy agency. So who the, what the hell is going on here? Why are these people spying on Kazakhstan and Lebanon and people in Venezuela and people in the US and everywhere? Um, so we figured we had better roll the attribution dice. Um, and we th okay, so is Lebanon behind Operation Mantle? Is Lebanon spying on the Kazakhstan uh, on the on the Kazakhs? Doesn't seem super likely. Are, are Kazakhstan spying on the Lebanese? Also, doesn't seem super likely. We we talked to some people who are apparently smart about geopolitics, and they said there's no reason that this would be happening. What we think is going on in this case is that somebody is renting out. Hacking as a service. Somebody is running out infrastructure and malware to any country that will pay for it. We think that the Kazakhs have taken them up on this service. We think that the Lebanese have taken them up on this service. Interestingly, Lebanon and Kazakhstan were two of the clients of Finn Fisher and Hacking Team that have now left. So maybe they've found a new provider, one who can work for a lot cheaper and still get the job done. So we wrote a report, because that's what we do. And uh, the AP went to, an AP reporter, uh, Associated Press, went to Lebanon 
and confirmed for themselves that there was actually the BLD3F6 access point coming out of the main spy agency, went and knocked on their door because AP reporters are freaking crazy, <laughs> and asked them about it, and they said, you know, uh, uh, so asked them about it, and the head of general security, uh, before he read the report, said, general security doesn't have these type of capabilities. We wish we had these capabilities. That would be amazing, but it totally wasn't us. The next day, an AP reporter went back, and the access point was down. Uh, and they got another quote from the general who is the head of, the major general head of general, director of general security. <laughs> and he said, I do not want to directly comment on the subject of the report. And I don't want to reveal our capabilities to our enemies because any information in this context may harm us. But I confirm that we possess all the material, all the means necessary to protect this country. I, it's not quite an admission. <laughs> Uh, he went on to call us a CIA and Mossad front, both at once, <laughs> which is pretty cool. I didn't know that I could work for both, but it's, I should be getting a lot more paychecks. <laughs> um, so what happened to us? Well, we didn't get, I obviously didn't get kidnapped because here I am. I ended up on a beach in Mexico. Uh, <laughs> So this is not something I ever thought would be the result of burning a spy agency, but here we are. I got invited to give a talk at a conference in Mexico, and I got a free trip to go there, which was pretty sweet, and I'm totally bragging. Um, but I also, well, I can go back to Lebanon, I just can't leave. So why should you? So why should yeah? So why should you care about this? Um, I've told a lot of funny jokes, but this shit is important. It's really important. As hackers, we have a choice about what we do. We can either go work for a corporation, or we can work for spies, and we can use our powers to make money and eventually get ground down like Charlie Chaplin inside of this giant machine. Or uh, we can do what we have done in the past. I was really inspired growing up by the Hacker Manifesto. Uh, and specifically this part, this is our world now, the beauty of this electron and the switch. We make use of a service already existing without paying for what could be dirt cheap if it wasn't run by plop profiteering gluttons. They call us criminals, we explore, they call us criminals. You build atomic bombs, you wage wars, you murder, cheat, and lie to us and make us believe it's for our own good, yet we're the criminals. That really spoke to me when I was growing up. And it still does. And now, the people that used to call us criminals want a piece of us. The military industrial complex and spy agencies want us to go work for them, to help them go bomb other people. Companies like Finn Fisher, companies like Lockheed Martin are suddenly all about hackers, when just 10 years ago they wanted us all in jail. And I say, fuck that. I want to be a hacker. I don't want to work for the, the rich and the powerful. I want to hack for people that need our help. I want to hack for people to free themselves. Let's go back to being hackers. We can still fight powerful adversaries, and we can still outsmart them. We can do all the really cool, amazing things we've always done, and we can work with constraints. We can work with very little money and still fight people that are way above our weight class, and we can take them down, and you might even end up on a beach for your efforts. So what do I want you to do? Well, smoking weed is a good start. <laughs> this is not legal advice, by the way. Not legal advice. EFF is a law firm, but this is not legal advice. My lawyer is going to kill me when he sees this. I want you to pick a cause you care about and get involved. Whatever speaks to you, wherever you're from. If if, if economic justice is your thing, if veterans justice is your thing, if feminism, if queer rights is your thing, whatever is your thing, wherever you're from, find the people that are working on that and go get involved with them. Recognize that you might not be hailed as the magical rock star unicorn that I know you are. Uh, in fact, when you come up to them, they're probably gonna slowly back away they're not gonna understand what you do, and you're gonna have to take the time to build trust and 
do some shit work. You're probably, you know, start out by sweeping. Start out by listening. But there's a lot of stuff you can do once you've built trust. You can reverse malware. You can reverse software and apps that vulnerable communities are using. You can give them education and training. Teach them how to use, teach them how to use password managers. Uh, you can do digital forensics and incident response when they get hacked. You can set up and maintain infrastructure, uh, like much like Rise Up and Calyx do, which are both amazing orgs that I want to shout out right now. <laughs> Give them applause. They're amazing. Go donate to them. They have booths. You can share intel on attacks against civil society. If you're in a position, if you're in a security company where you see attacks against human rights defenders, let people know. Let me know. Let Citizen Lab know. Let somebody know. Let the people that are being attacked know. Uh, but not in a way that scares the shit out of them. <laughs> if you call people up and say you've been hacked, it generally scares the shit out of them. Um, if you work for enterprise, try to build in better nation state warnings. Twitter has a version of this that says, hey, you've been attacked by a nation state, but they don't tell you who and they don't tell you what to do about it. Um, but maybe better versions of those would be good. It's a start. But most importantly, you need to listen and have empathy. You can't go into any place as a savior. We're not saviors. We're co-defendants. And we, yeah. <laughs> we're co-conspirators, we're not saviors, and we need to work with people, we need to work with people, and we need to love people, and we need to listen to them, and we need to have empathy with them. Hackers are kind of like superheroes. Uh, we're mopey, but we also have a lot of powers that most of society doesn't have. We're really powerful. We can do things that people can't dream of. We can take an entire country offline. And we have a choice about how we use those powers. We can use them to get, make ourselves rich, or we can use them to help the rich get richer and help cops beat the shit out of people. Or we can use them for good. We can use our powers to make the world a better place. And I think we really need to think about how we use our power. As my favorite superhero said, with great power comes great responsibility. Thank you very much. So some quick shout outs to Nushi, Eva Side, Flossman, Andrew Mike, and the rest of the Lookout team, all of my colleagues at EFF and Freedom of the Press Foundation, Radical Designs, Alex Kaida, Evil Tech, Sup G, Smarts, the whole Hack the Zine and Hack Block crew, Gemini Matt, Martin S. Sequoia, NVHC, Virus Total, Joe Sandbox, Hex Race, Kaspersky for donating free shit, and everyone else who asked not to be named for what are hopefully now obvious reasons. And thanks, last but not least, to all of you and the Circle of Hope. So, questions. I think I have a... Uh, Two minutes? I have two minutes. So like one question. Or come find me afterwards. Thanks a lot. Have a question? All right. Um, I'm a huge fan of the Electronic Frontier Foundation and I appreciate this work. Um, and I thank you for the work that the EFF has done um, to minimize mass surveillance and targeted surveillance. Um, as a Lebanese uh, citizen and as someone who was born and grew up in Lebanon, uh, what I'm seeing from my perspective is um, uh, a really you know, talented and capable team that sees themselves as morally very righteous, uh, performing acts of heroism, but I also see um, a kind of uh, moral objectification of the target that frankly and with all due respect to your work and in the best of intentions I cannot be comfortable with because you know when you come up and joke that you know Lebanon is not a country that's gonna let you out if you go back there I mean do you really have the standing to make that joke and when you go and interfere in this kind of uh, operation is it an illegitimate operation I think so I agree with you it is most likely but do you really understand the geopolitical context of a place like Lebanon? Do you really think that you can use the same framework that you use to evaluate something like the NSA, something like the GCHQ? I know that the EFF could have these capabilities. I know that you are competent. But the fashion in which you present this work, I mean, how can you 
be so blatant in labeling yourselves as heroes and so dismissive and shallow, or as it seems to me, to analyzing the context of, of these operations, the context of Lebanese politics. I mean, we don't even know who these targets were. We don't even know what the legal framework was. We don't even know what the security framework was. I grew up in Lebanon. I went through three wars before I was 18. You know, it's not, it's not the United States. And so how can you, I mean, what is the due diligence with regards to this stuff? Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Nadim. Those are, those are really excellent questions. Those, and that's, those are all extremely legit criticisms of this work. Um, and you're right, I have no, my, my context for the geopolitical situation in Lebanon is very, 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 very limited. Uh, we did run the report by SMEX, which is a Lebanese, for uh, the rest of you, a Lebanese uh, digital civil liberties organization. But your, your criticisms are all, like I have, I have no argument against them. I, I hear that and I, if, if I'm propping up Western exceptionalism with this talk, I would feel really shitty about that. Um, I, there are a number of reasons that this spy agency might be spying on civilians, which I didn't get into the details of the victims, but there were a lot of civilians in there. And I don't think that any spy agency in any country should be doing that. I don't think that they're, like, whether That's it's true. Lebanon or whether it's the USA. I, as far as being, as far as being disappeared, like I said, Maybe, maybe that wouldn't happen. Like maybe Lebanon is not as bad as, as the USA in that sense. I don't know. I know that the USA, if I had, if, it was, if the tables were turned and I was a Lebanese person reporting on the USA, I know that the USA would absolutely put my ass in Guantanamo if I ever showed up here. So th that's legit. And would that happen in Lebanon? I actually can't say. Um, but yeah, thank you very much. And uh, I'd be happy to talk to you more about it uh, off the stage. Thank you for this valuable and interesting work. Thanks.